Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, let me begin by thanking all of my colleagues on this side of the House for standing and defending Budget 2020, a budget for the people of Guyana. Mr. Speaker, I also want to thank the members of the opposition who participated in this debate for displaying for the public to see the reasons why they are not in government. Because this budget debate made it clear to all of Guyana why the APNU AFC is not in government. They came to the National Assembly, sir, and they behaved like if they were under the tent outside on the road where they were spinning narratives for five months, expecting people to believe their misinformation campaign. Mr. Speaker, the fact that we are in this house tonight tells the world and every Guyanese that democracy is back in place. Secondly, sir, the in a parliamentary democracy is back in action in Guyana. Mr. Speaker, next week we will spend the entire week scrutinizing the estimates. It means that Guyanese will have an opportunity to know how, where, and who is spending their money. Since December 2018, Monies have been expended, and not even the investigative reporters in our media was able to discover what was going on. One of the things why the APNUFC lost the no confidence motion and then lost the elections, the people in Guyana cannot trust their word, cannot trust what they're saying. Mr. Speaker, I listened to Mr. Roysdale Ford and Christopher Jones and the motley band of APNU AFC parliamentarians. I know what it reminded me of, sir. The Missing, missing the Jones court case, the Ulita Moore court case, and the Eslin David court case, where people go to the courts and spin narratives and read what the Constitution never said and try to say something that is inaccurate and everybody knows it is wrong. And then it reminds me of the Richardson uh, case and all the other cases that they went out there with about 34 and 33 and the half man and, and all the explanations that we used to get. Obviously, they didn't read the budget. But you can't blame me, Mr. Speaker, for their lack of comprehension. The nation now knows that the APNU AFC had problems with both math and English. The Minister of Education needs lots more resources in her budget to help them in math and in English. I don't know what next to do, sir. But Mr. Speaker, Allow me to explain a few things. The world over, in a COVID-19 pandemic environment, is focusing on three things, sir. To protect lives, which is extremely important. Secondly, to protect livelihoods. And to prepare for the recovery of the economy. The world has said to us, it is one thing to save lives by way of the COVID-19 pandemic, but if the economy flattens, 
you will soon die from hunger and starvation. So when we approached budget 2020, we knew that the priorities had to do to make the necessary investments to safeguard the livelihoods of people. That is why we spared no investment in health. By ensuring in every ministry, in every budget agency, in every region, sufficient monies are appropriated to deal with this pandemic. We know there is nothing worse than having our children at home and not going back to school because while well, they should be progressing, if they're not learning, they could start regressing. And Mr. Speaker, we made the necessary investments to ensure that learning takes place in a COVID-19 environment virtually we put more monies in to ensure that the learning channel is expanded. And the Honorable Member, Mr. Schumann, this morning raised concerns for the Amerindian communities. But Mr. Schumann will be well advised and he should know that we're not just dealing with internet, but we're dealing with radio, television, and print materials. The people of the hinterland will have packages delivered to their homes. There will be community learning. We have developed a capacity in partnership with other outfits to ensure that a learning channel will be able to broadcast five or six different modules simultaneously to each to reach different age groups. The investment in education was to deal with the reality. But we also had to put investments to deal with infrastructure. The schools have to have the washrooms upgraded. They have to have the, the sinks for the washing of hands, proper ventilation and proper environment. And of course, if my colleagues who are having problems with both math and English had read the budget, they would have understood that those interventions are being made. Mr. Speaker, It was the Honorable Member, Nicolette Henry, who said, people deserve much better than a PPP government. And then I heard Mr. Roysdale for the Honorable Member referring to them as the representatives of the majority. That is why I said we are still under the tent. But thank God one Honorable Member was willing enough to admit that they represent 217,000 votes. And it was the first admission that they lost the elections. We on this side, even though we got 232,000 plus votes, 233,000 plus votes, we don't only represent those 233,412, I think was the number, voters, we represent as the legitimate government every Guyanese living in Ghana. And this budget, sir, was designed and prepared to enhance the lives and safeguard all of our people in Guyana. Mr. Speaker, I heard words to describe this budget that really made me wonder if the APNU AFC really understand the meaning of words or they're just getting involved in semantics. I heard them say that the budget is discriminatory. Mr. Speaker, who is discriminating against? The 11,000 plus members of the Joint Services that will benefit from the two-month to two-week bonus. Which one of them will not get it? The more than 200,000 households that will get the 25,000 COVID-19 assistance. Who is discriminated against? The health workers who will benefit from the 150 million who are on the front line fighting 
who it will discriminate against. I don't understand. These words to them are words that are catchy and it is meant to create misinformation and to misguide a group of people into a belief. Mr. Speaker, I also heard him say that the budget is divisive. Well, who is the budget dividing? If they understood this divisive and the meaning of divisive, the rhetoric in this house would have been different because they have been divisive in government. They have been divisive during the election campaign. They have been divisive since March 2nd, during the five months. They have been divisive since President Irvin Ali was sworn into government. And when they got an opportunity, they capitalized opportunistically on the mishap of two young men and became more divisive. In coming to this house, in the pretense of paying solidarity to the death of young men, they used the occasion to divide. Why did one of them, including the honorable member, Mr. Trotman, who puts himself up to the world as someone who believes in reconciliation and is a mediator and believes in resolving of conflicts, why did he get up and apologize? to the hundreds and thousands of Guyanese who were beaten, robbed, and harmed while trying to go about their legitimate business of getting home or getting to Georgetown to business during that period of time. A wrong is a wrong, and it must be condemned as wrong. And when politicians use the occasion of a budget debate to get press opportunities, to spread divisive language, it must be condemned in the strongest possible terms. And I so do tonight, sir, as I close this debate. Mr. Speaker, they say that the budget is defective. But have we corrected? If it is defective, put out to the public one suggestion to correct it. Have we heard any over the five days? Have we received any recommendation that could make us produce for the people of Guyana something better? We in government don't claim to be made all. In as much as we have one of the best practical applied economists in the Caribbean in our camp, in the person of Vice President Bayajadio, we don't claim to know it all. But come to the Parliament, if you're going to come here and make criticism that it is defective, point out how it is defective. Well, you can't do that. But you could go to the media and you could use fancy language to deceive. Then they say the budget is deceptive. Well, I got worried. Because, you know, Mr. Speaker, in 2015, in their first budget, I accused the APNU AFC of being an urban, middle class, pseudo Christian elite bunch. But I was wrong. Mr. Speaker, I discovered that they are a bold, brazen, and bare-faced group. That is how I describe them now. Bold, brazen, and bare-faced. You have lied, Mr. Speaker. I apologize. They have spoken on truth. They have spoken things that does not resemble the truth. They have spoken the things that could, ne could never be near to the truth. They have developed an art of alternative facts and spinning narratives. Mr. Speaker, you cannot be a legislator representing people and be delusional at the same time. 
I am concerned about what Guyana's future will be like if we have to be in a partnership with people who are still in denial and are operating in an environment of being delusional. To refer to this government as unlawful, illegal, fraudulent. You have to be of a special nature and character. You have to be bold. People saw you, listened to you, were led by you. Then all of a sudden you disappeared because the cookie jar broke and the whole world saw what was in the cookie jar. And then you come to this August assembly to say that the budget is deceptive. Mr. Speaker, I hope you are going to memorize the forward reading from the budget and using arguments from the budget to say that the economy was great when they left it. Well, if the language that he used and he read is in the budget document, how could it be deceptive? When we place the truth on the table, when we brought the truth as it relates to the state of the economy, the non oil economy, the sectors that were struggling and the sectors that were limping along, we brought the truth to the table and we told the whole nation that while we pay attention to petroleum and put in place the things that are needed for the development of the oil and gas sector, we have to pay attention to the non-oil sector. And that is why we put $5 billion in the budget for Gaishuku to reopen the Shoah estate. They have a problem with that. Mr. Speaker, some overzealous person in the opposition who probably got somebody to write a speech to them came with a written script that says, Where are the jobs? Mr. Speaker, if they had listened to the Honorable Member Colin Crowell and they had listened to the Honorable Member Susan Rodriguez about what is going to take place just in one sector, Housing and water. They will know. If you're building houses, it's jobs. The hardware store, the counter driver, the drake yard man, Mr. Speaker, even the junkie who's going to clean up after the construction of the work. If they had read the budget, they would have understood that. If they had listened, to the Honorable Member, the Ministry of Tourism, Industry and Commerce, they would have heard the fact that we are going to industrial estates and opening up opportunities for manufacturing. That is where jobs are. If we're talking about agro-processing, jobs. If we're talking about incentives for the planting of corn and soya beans, plantation, agriculture, jobs. If we talk about removing the vat on mining equipment and forestry equipment and heavy duty equipment, it means that the boys at Golden Grove and Stroud Villa the Namstel that is landing at 8 o'clock in the morning could head back into the interior and come out shouting and sweating going back to their families happy and not sucking blows like what they did under the last five years. Jobs! When we talk about recapitalizing the forestry sector and putting in new policies, including the possibility for the export of logs, communities of Huru and, 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 and Aichuni and Mabur and Tamaka and, and Mauritania and Malawi and all those areas in Region 10 where people were helpless and hopeless would start smiling again because they're going back to work. Whether it's with the power saw, 
already skitter. They're going back to work. Jobs. Mr. Speaker, you know, but there are some issues that the public must understand as we close this debate. This up new AFC government took over government in 2015. This up new AFC opposition now, I should say. Sorry. Took over government in 2015, and the vice president alluded to it in his presentation this afternoon. On the government payroll was thirty four thousand and seventy three active employees. Last year, twenty nineteen, it went up by twenty six point nine percent. Now they may want to make an argument how more people got employed. But do they have anything to show that what these more people that they employed did to make Guyana better? The salary that they moved the employment up to 40 to 43,169. 9,000 more people they packed in the public service. You know what that meant? Their friends, their family, their political activists, they put them on the payroll to do political work. They still lost the election, and much of the agencies and departments did not see improvement, did not see modernization. The delivery of goods and services were so poor that adjectives to describe it will cause us to have to move from Friday night to Saturday. Mr. Speaker, when we talk about mismanagement, and you have people who are bold, barefaced, and brazen, who would come to this house to like the Honorable David Patterson and Annette Ferguson, who will come to this house to tell us all the nice things that they did about the David Otto Granger administration? The most important thing about this speech is the pronunciation of David Otto Granger. Well, comrades, Mr. Speaker and friends, it's not how the name is called that makes you successful, it's what you do. I have in my hands, Mr. Speaker, a document. And you know the at new AFC got problems when Edgel holds documents. They threatened the two hundred million lawsuits and in the previous parliament they carry you to the privileges committee and they try to silence you. But documents don't lie. I talk about the Cherry Jagan International Airport. Mr Speaker the original contract of the airport required that we will have 9,000 square meters of construction. 9,000 square meters of construction. You know what we ended up with in the revised contract? 4,046 square meters. Half. Less than half was done. Mr. Speaker, and not only the fact that less than half was done, they have now saddled us with a bill. There is no space for the offices of airlines. The cargo facilities still need to be upgraded. The commercial center still needs to be fixed and built. And Mr. Speaker, I have an estimate in my hands that apart from the 150 million US that was already spent, plus the other two plus million for the two additional air bridges, 
we will have to find another 1.3 plus billion dollars to fix the Chetty Jagan International Airport. Thanks to David Otter Granger, David Patterson, Anna Ferguson, and the APNU AFC. A round of applause to them. They've done well. They should go under the tent and explain to people. I challenge Mr. Sherrod Duncan, the honorable member, and Mr. Christopher Jones, the honorable member, to go under the tent or on their website or come back to Parliament. They run and gone tonight to explain these atrocities. Paying more and getting less. Bloat in employment. And you still can't get through. You still can't get nothing done. When the Honorable Member, Dr. Frank Anthony, spoke and he told us about what took place in the Ministry of Health, Mr. Speaker, as the Minister, and I want to report to this House that some responsibility has been delegated by His Excellency the President to deal with some matters of finance. I went to the tender board to extract from it information as it relates to procurement of drugs and medical supplies during the period. So when my colleagues stood up here and said, there is no information available that since 2017, even though large amounts of money, billions of dollars were appropriated, there is no evidence of its procurement. Where the money gone? And then when the Honorable Minister tell us that 60% of the materials management unit, what we call the drug bond at Diamond, contains expired drugs. It tells you about the kind of management that the APNU AFC offered to us. So, Mr. Speaker, I don't want to have to go through each and every item that was mentioned, but it was clear that even though they stood up to praise the fact that Mr. Winston Jordan did all these excellent budgets, where is Winston Jordan? Why is not in the parliament to defend his legacy? And where is the financial expert among them who could come and speak to both the fiscal and monetary, monetary policies? Do you know that in all five days of the presentations coming from the opposition, none of them have been able to point to a single item in the budget that they have problems with as it relates to its allocation, its appropriation, and if it would really benefit the people. They came with vacuous statements, broad brushing the budget. It's defective, it's deceptive, it's divisive, it's discriminatory. They have a, a fetish for these nice sounding phrases because like it catches on on Facebook and they get people to believe the rhetoric. But Mr. Speaker, it's Friday night, and my colleagues have so eloquently defended this budget. It makes my time in rebutting tonight very simple, and I don't have to be long. But Mr. Speaker, let me wrap up this debate by telling everybody in Guyana that the nature of an emergency budget at the national level has required us to address swiftly and decisively some issues. We got into office and we had to diagnose and solve problems. Every minister, when they got to their sector, after they were sworn in, they had to diagnose 
and we have to put those solutions. This COVID-19 pandemic is before us and we have to collectively work to ensure that we all remain safe. Our livelihoods, our businesses, the small businesses must be protected and we have to find a balance between keeping people safe and making sure that the economy don't collapse. We have to, we have to expand access to and the capacity for testing. We have to implement the wearing of a mask as a compulsory measure. And Mr. Speaker, we were very saddened that you could not have been physically with us. But we must congratulate you for the great job you did, even though conducting virtually. But if we did not have some irresponsible people, you would have been saved. And many of the parliament staff would have been spared of being tested positive. But we have people who are more interested in their images on Facebook than in taking care of themselves and their brothers and sisters. Mr. Speaker, when I came here last Wednesday and presented our budget, and I say our budget because this budget that was read by me, sir, in as much as I led a team that had to produce it, it was our budget. Every minister and every one of us participated in putting it together. And I want to thank my colleagues for their hard work and participation. But they had been in denial so long. If they had allowed democracy to have its course, we would have been in a better place today. Mr. Speaker, Last night I had the opportunity of saying to U.S. Secretary of State, Mr. Pompeo, and Mr. Kozak, thanks for what you did for Guyana. Mr. Speaker, isn't it interesting that the language that we are hearing from top U.S. officials is no longer about protecting democracy and respecting the will of the Guyanese people. But just today, we sign an MOU that will see American businesses coming to Guyana in a fair and transparent way to invest in energy and in infrastructure to take Guyana to the next level. That could have been happening much earlier. And my colleagues spoke about this. Mr. Speaker, COVID-19 didn't just happen after the election. And I know Mr. Harmon, who for some reason was moved from being director, well, remember he was Minister of State, then he became Director General, and then he became CEO of the COVID Secretariat. And then he didn't want to give up his job. If he, the honorable member, and the APNU AFC government had been more proactive since November and December of 2019 and January and February and March of 2020. Much more could have been done for this. But they were too busy under the tent, spitting narratives, leading a campaign of misinformation, did they answer the questions that the Guyanese people were having? Did they prepare to ensure that Guyanese lives were protected and their livelihoods were protected? The answer is no. 
There was no real planning. There was no real planning. And because there was no planning, when we came to government, we had to rescue the ship. But Mr. Speaker, this budget, don't speak to everything that the PPPC will do in the next five years. This is an emergency budget. And because it is an emergency budget, we were faithful to keep promises that we made to the electorate, to make the necessary interventions that could be done immediately, and to create fiscal space to ensure that we address the emergencies of COVID-19. That is why we put money in the budget for emergency purchasing of drugs and medical supplies, over $3 billion. That is why we put in the budget monies to, affect, to, 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 to be of support to households who have been impacted, $4.5 billion. That is why we put money in the budget to help with education, $300 million. That is why we put in the budget because we know regions one, seven, eight, and nine heavily impacted as our interior regions. We put in $300 million to be able to equip those communities with tractors and trailers and they could get back to agriculture and they could move to agro-processing. That is why we put in the budget, sir, opportunities for individuals, small, medium, and large-scale investments could benefit from the removal of back on important items. We told our men and our women in uniform that we will restore their bonus. And even in an environment where we have to create fiscal space, to deal with funding in a pandemic, we did not forget our men and women in uniform. And in this emergency environment, we are giving them a two-month, uh, sorry, a two-week bonus at this time. We will deliver to the people of Guyana. We will, like we always did in the 23 years, that we were in government 1992 to 2015, held our hands out to the people of Guyana. Mr. Speaker, why I ask that this budget be adopted and passed in this house, I stretch out my arms of friendship, saying to the men and women who were elected to sit in this noble house, who now sit in the opposition benches, it is not too late to repent. It's not too late to tell your supporters you are sorry. It's not too late to turn your life around. It's not too late to start behaving responsibly. It's not too late to start being human again. It's not too late. You know, it is one thing, and I listen. Everybody got scriptures now in their speeches. As if, as if a scripture, when you quote it, it makes you more righteous than those who didn't quote it. But Mr. Speaker, the same scriptures that you're quoting tells you, by your fruits you shall know them. Guava tree got to bear guava. Cherry tree got to bear cherry. Righteous trees got to bear righteousness. Not stealing an election and deceiving a nation. So, quoting scriptures and thanking Almighty God. Jesus spoke about that, you know, Mr. Speaker. I know you read the Bible. 
He referred to people like that as scribes and Pharisees. And his language was not very complimentary itself. It was not my language. He called it wiping sepulchres with dead men's bones. In everyday language, you're a tomb painted nicely, but inside full of skin. But it's not too late. The PPPC comes to this house with budget 2020, not for prosperity for PPP supporters, but for prosperity for all thy needs. The PPPC comes to this house not to incentivize PPP friendly private sector businesses, but we come to this house with measures to incentivize every business in Guyana, whether you voted or financed the APNU, AFC, you are still benefiting from these measures. Mr. Speaker, so we have to make it known we stand willing and ready to stretch out our hands of partnership. But you know they say in Guyana, one hand can't clap. So in as much as we are ready to work, they must show the willingness. And Mr. Speaker, whenever there is a conflict, whenever there is a crisis, whenever there is a problem, the number one thing that is needed for dispute resol resolution is an acknowledgement that a wrong was done. And if you've got people coming here to still justify and to sing from a song sheet or, to, or, or to, to, to read a script that the PPPC is illegal and fraudulent the threats in the National Assembly breathing out threats just now it will be removed two years it will be there and all the threats we got to change our attitude Mr. Speaker but I say we are willing ready and able. Dr. Muhammad Afan Ali and Team PPPC will lead Diana for all dinings and I recommend to you Budget 2020. Thank you very much Mr. Speaker and God bless Diana.